morning everybody. It's my pleasure to be here at my first ever TED talk. So if I appear in your nervous, can I go? Okay, I am going to talk to you about, about a fashion that possibly you don't know about. I, I'm quite sure you want to hear about Deepika Padukone or Aishwarya Rai or all the girls that I made into models and stars, but you're not going to hear about them. I'm sorry. I discovered them in malls, put them on ramp, put them on, on screen. But uh, I'm going to talk to you about a fashion that goes beyond all of that because it's a fashion world that you don't see. And it's a fashion world that I'm very interested in and it's a fashion world that took me on my journey to be where I am today. When I first uh, joined fashion, it was about the fact that I knew that I was employing people. And this employment was very important to me. I always said to myself, and I always told my company, I am a duffer with math. I don't know how to price my garments. My company does all that for me. I do the shows, and they'll say, we don't care what to do with the clothes. The neckline can go all the way down to Kanyakumari. The slits can go all the way up to the Himalayas. But after you finish your show, we are going to take those garments, we are going to raise the neckline, we are going to add the sleeves, we are going to do everything to sell those garments. So please don't interfere with us after that because we have to feed so many employees. And that actually is always at the back of my mind that fashion is about employment. We are one of the biggest employing people industry in the country. We, you look at fashion only based on what you see on ramp and the latest haircut and the latest bag and the latest shoe, etc. There's a whole world behind that. There are cotton growers, there are silk weavers who grow uh, actually uh, silkworms on mulberry trees. You have people who are, who are rearing sheep. All these people are the production. Then come the other people who dye the clothes, who print the clothes, who weave the garments etc etc and behind this is also people who do embroidery so we are talking about a multi crore industry which employs a lot of people that we cannot afford to let down which is why when i first heard that i was on the border of goa karnataka and maharashtra there was a project started by an ngo by sally holkar actually where she found that that forest was depleting itself because the tribals were using the firewood to actually cook their food. In the process, they were living in small little huts. In the process, they were destroying the forest. Animals ran away and their health turned very bad. So they started to... Now do I start this? Yeah. Okay. So they started to deplete this forest. And the NGO stepped in, natural dyes, and they said, Please do not uh, deplete this forest because you'll have cut too many trees, the animals have run away, you all are sick, we are going to give you free gas. So they gave them free gas. And the free gas meant that the ladies were now cooking on a little table in a gas cylinder underneath. And they said, now we are going to plant this forest again. So they began to plant that forest again and they planted the forest again. And then later on we would take from them every three months the dyes that we wanted. Whether it was Manjista or dye that is antiseptic which came from the time of the Mahabharata or indigo. And we used these dyes and after seven years the forest came back, everything came back and we actually got this forest back. We got our dyes, it was a win-win situation. Those are the ladies who, who are collecting the dyes or the leaves. If we strip every few, uh, three months, we take either the bark or the flowers or the leaves and use them. And then I decided there was a Goan sari that was not being worn for a hundred years because actually it was abandoned by the tribals because the Portuguese came and did not want us to wear that sari. In fact, they wanted to convert us to Catholics completely. And due to the Inquisition, they made sure that we didn't wear Indian clothes. So this sari was... I can speak without it actually. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Yes. Great, so we don't need your sound. Uh, <laughs> So, and we, have, we need to go back on the time, okay, because it's been clocking and going. <laughs> I, so, uh, actually what we did was, this sari was not being worn by the tribals because the Brahminical Hinduism put them at the lowest end of the uh, rung of social status. And then what happened was, they didn't want to wear the sari. 
the Brahmins didn't want to wear the sari because it was too low for them to wear. So we said, listen, let's reinvent the sari. And we began a revival where we actually took these plants and we began to weave a new sari. It was not in red, white and black. We used the indigo, we used manjista, we used all these dyes that we had collected from this NGO and we wove the sari. And the sari is called Kunbi Sari. And here we have my friend Lisa Ray who is modeling the sari. The poor thing had uh, cancer at that stage. The people didn't know. She thought that she was, she was going to pass away because she had myeloma. Multiple myeloma but she somehow managed to cure herself with stem cells. And you know it was Lisa's, Lisa's kind of push that made me say we are going to make this sari come alive. And people who didn't want to wear the sari for a hundred years Suddenly, Sonia Gandhi came behind it and Priyanka Gandhi came behind it and the cotton-wearing women like Laila Tiyabji, etc. They said, we want to wear this sari and a sari that should have sold for 700 rupees now had a waiting list to sell at 7,000 rupees. So, it depends on your product, what you want to do and you go out into the world, you can make something that's really cheap, really expensive and sell it and make a lot of money. Now, what happened to this sari was it finally got looked on by the world's largest garment fair in the world, which I didn't know existed in, a, uh, in Germany, in Nuremberg of all places, which I thought was only important for World War II, when they gave the Nuremberg files and, the, and they kind, kind of put every, all the Nazis in jail. But Nuremberg decided to reinvent themselves. And I said to myself, if Nuremberg can reinvent themselves as the organic capital fair of the world, we, as Indians, can also reinvent ourselves and do whatever we want. There is a small little uh, village called Kanoj in UP. Do you know they make fragrances? This is not like grass, like in France, the big fat grass factory which produces all the best perfumes in the world for Chanel and for Givenchy, etc. They have been producing from the time of the Mughals and they also have a perfume which grass cannot produce. It is called the fragrance of the monsoon. They make it out of mitti, out of pure mud. And they actually make the perfume. If you open the bottle in a small place called Kanoj, you can actually smell the taste of the first monsoon. And I said to myself, this is where we are going to go. This is where we are going to put our own DNA, which is Indian, into the clothes, into a foreign international standing. When I was in Paris and studying, my teacher told me, Wendell, do not think of yourself as the best designer on your street, the best designer in your school, the best designer in, in your college, in Bombay, in Goa. No. You have to think of yourself, all of you in this room. You are going to think of yourself as the best designer, the best management person, the best actor, the best speaker in the world. You got to start from the world level. Once you know that is your world level, the world is going to come to you like they came to me. You are not going to be this person who is going to be the best on the street. That's too easy to do. You do not want to do that. You want to make sure that you are going to be the best in the world. So I said like Kanoj, if they can make perfume out of the first mitti from the monsoon, this is art. So fashion is a way also of talking about art. And I said, why not? We talk about art through the clothes. We spoke about many forms of art. This is one art, which is, which is the artist Mondrian. Piet Mondrian was born in Holland. Nobody heard of him. We said, forget about making Western clothes. We are going to make a sari. We are going to do what Usha Utup did to her sari. She was singing Western garments. She was Skyfall by Adele in a sari. So we are going to push our what we have, you know. All of us have a DNA inside of us. Nobody can do Kashmir fashion like Rose Bal. Nobody can do Calcutta fashion like Savya Sachi. And if somebody attempts to do Goa fashion like me, I will kill them. <laughs> Pure and simple. You have to take your DNA because that is hiding inside of you. You cannot start doing something which France does because you will not be better than them. When I applied for a job at Yves Saint Laurent, the lady told me, Sir, your sketches are very good, but Mr. Saint Laurent can do all these gowns and jackets and dresses. Why don't I see your country and your wonderful state of Goa and your clothes? 
So with my tail between my legs, I came back to India and I said, I am going to put my, my DNA, my country and my state into the clothes. And that's what you all have to do, no matter what management job you get, you have to put yourself, if you know your, uh, your area where you are going to make sure that you do it as well as you can. Then we are going to talk about why fashion is important. We have to give a chance to everyone. You can't say in your company, this, per this person over here, this lady, her name, she was born a man. At 19, she had a sex change. Her name is Mona Veronica Campbell. And the beauty of fashion is that we can give a chance to everyone. We can give people who are, who are transgenders like her a chance to become somebody else. Through educational institutions, we can make students dream. Have you seen in school how when you're in a play or when you're acting? <laughs> you guys can hear me in the background. Yes. Please put that off. You don't need it at all. When, when you realize that fashion can empower you to create somebody else, to be somebody else, whether you are an old person in an old age home where I have shown them fashion videos, whether they are old people who say, I say, can I dress you up and they will do a catwalk in an old age home when they are 85 years old and they are all getting excited. That's what we want of the world today. We want the world to get excited because it is a great and wonderful place to live because we can do this, we can give this girl, we can give acid attack victims. We can give people who have disabilities to go onto the ramp and make icons of them. We have to look for icons because we create those icons in fashion. Look at Kim Kardashian. She was known for her porn films, right? I'm sure you have all seen them, but you have all And then she uh, she is on the cover of Vogue. Not only Vogue India, which happened this month, but some months ago where she came on Vogue USA. We are looking for icons everywhere and there's no shame in this business because we want to make sure that everybody gets an equal chance because you deserve that extra chance. You can become somebody else that you don't want to be or you cannot be through fashion and through your business. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go back to what I started by saying as far as employment is concerned. Do you know we are... Uh, we are going to uh, be the world's largest possibly employer in the future. As it stands today, we are $1.4 trillion worth. What does that mean to you guys? I don't think it can mean anything in dollars for an entire year, $1.4 trillion. But I can give you an example. The pharma industry in the entire world is only worth half of that. So we know how important we are in fashion. I'm going to leave you with a small story that I personally did. There was a gentleman who came to me and who said, uh, Mr. Rodrix, can I, I cannot see. When I was young, I could see. Can you do me t-shirts with braille on it? That kind of braille, right? A, B, C, D with dots. So I said, uh, Professor Acharya, why do you want to only do these, uh, these t-shirts? How does it help you? He said, it doesn't help me, but people who have sight can see it. So I said, okay, fine. Then I asked him, how do you dress? He said, I take 45 minutes to dress every day. My wife can see. She also teaches with me in the school for the blind in Bombay. My, my wife can see, so I have to pull out one shirt from the cupboard and ask her, what color is this shirt? When I was young, I could see, but now I can't see. So then I wanted to wear that day a white shirt with a gray pant. She would say, no, it's not white. Then I would throw the shirt back. Take out the next shirt. Take out the third shirt until I disturb seven shirts and I got my white shirt. Same with the pants. And it took me 45 minutes to dress. And we pull the clothes out, we get a conference in 10 minutes, and we're out the door. I said, this is terrible, how do we help them? So I don't know why anybody in the world did not think of this before I did. But I spent nine months thinking. I said, I am going to put those alphabets in braille on the clothes. So I went and took a photocopy of the braille typewriter and we put in small French knots and small beads on linen cloth uh, the words and I sent it to Professor Acharya and I said, can you read? He said, sir, I can't read anything. I said, why can't you read? He said, because you people with eyesight, you can see your alphabet A as tall as a building and as small as an ant. For us, it has to fit in the balls of our fingers for, for us to be able to read it. 
So I said, oh, then I got it. So I, I typed out the letter. I got it to, uh, I, I, by now I, was, I knew we had cracked the code. I, I put it on to a, a shirt and I wrote on that shirt in Braille, sent it to him and I said, Professor Achyara, can you read? And he started crying. And I said, why are you crying? He said, I can't read. I said, what does it say? He says, it says, the Wendell Rodericks Visionaire Collection, color white, size medium. And that changed. That changed the blind people's way of reading their clothes forever in the world. Today it's mandatory in every uh, visually challenged school all across the world that they have to learn how to put their brain, either they or their parents or their families or their spouse has to learn to put braille onto their clothes and that's what we did finally. That is Malaika Rora Khan, my friend, who you think is, is fondling her breath, she's not. She's reading that braille which is on top, which says the Wendell Rodericks Visionary Collection. And with that, I'm going to end my talk. I, I have still half a minute left. But I'm going to end my talk by telling you, recapping what I just said. You are unique in the world. You have your own DNA, bring it in. Try to be the best international person that you can in the world. Grab every opportunity, whether it is me writing my book because Mario Miranda told me to study the history of Goan fashion. Whether it is a challenge like Braille that comes your way, grab it. It's a beautiful life and you deserve it. Thank you. <laughs>